Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. It often happens that life develops not exactly as we want it to. When Otilio Borrego got married, he certainly didn't anticipate ending up alone, forced to raise two daughters on his own. Like all happy newlyweds in love, he had joyful and carefree images in his mind. Unfortunately, no one is exempt from sorrow, disappointments, and hardships, and Otilio was no exception. If someone had told him about his future, he would have simply laughed it off. Who could have believed that his wife, a woman and a mother, would easily leave her husband and children? Such a scenario was almost unthinkable at the time. There were always wayward fathers, but speaking about bad mothers. Women, typically, are endowed with a sense of duty and responsibility. Apparently, Melba was not immune to all of this. She became disillusioned with marriage and the dull, monotonous life of a family mother filled with sorrows, disappointments, boredom, and problems. So the young woman clearly lacked joy in her life. When Otilio returned from work after a grueling shift at the factory and found a note from his wife on the kitchen table, he was stunned and initially didn't believe it. He thought it was a foolish prank. However, he couldn't find any of Melba's belongings in the apartment. Believing and realizing what had happened took immense effort and strength. In the note, Melba told her husband that she couldn't take their daughters with her. Her new partner only wanted to raise his own children. Therefore, she entrusted the responsibility for their daughters and their upbringing to her husband. She also mentioned that she would provide financial assistance when possible. Apparently, that never happened. When Melba left, the daughters were just little girls. The elder, Rebecca, was only eight years old, and the younger, Alfreda, had recently turned four. It was impossible to understand a mother who abandoned her children. However, as Otilio learned from his bitter experience, such situations occurred not only in melodramas, but also in real life. Neither Otilio nor the girls ever saw Melba again. She remotely filed for divorce and relinquished her parental rights to the girls. Certainly, none of the three went through this situation smoothly and without pain. Each of them experienced their own grief and disappointment. The girls cried in a childlike manner, and Otilio sometimes even started drinking heavily, but he quickly came to his senses. He realized that if something happened to him, it would be the end for his daughters. This realization gave him strength and helped mobilize his internal resources. The father worked hard to earn an extra penny and provide the best for his daughters. Now, he had to be not only a father but also a substitute for their mother. So he did his best. The man not only focused on financial support but also cared for, loved, and protected his daughters. He wanted them to develop comprehensively various clubs, music and art schools, swimming pools, everything was available to them just like any other children. Otilio himself developed a complex. He didn't want to deprive his daughters. He tried his best to give them everything so that they wouldn't feel like this. They were already growing up without a mother, and that was enough. He felt that they already had childhood traumas. There was no need to worsen a terrible life situation. Naturally, with such a frenetic pace of life and an enormous amount of concerns and problems, the man had to put himself not just on the back burner, but perhaps much further away. He didn't even consider the idea of tending to his personal life at all. Although many advisors, especially men, strongly recommended simply finding a new mother for the girls and shifting all the responsibilities to the new wife. For Otilio, this was simply unacceptable and inconceivable. He had no idea whether this new woman would be a decent person, become a real mother to his daughters, or be able to replace their mother. No way. If the biological mother could cause such pain to the children and treat her own children like that, then what can one say about a stranger? The man pondered. And perhaps his reasoning was logical. He didn't want to admit to himself that the pain was inflicted not only on the girls. He, too, was monstrously traumatized by his wife's actions. Otilio loved his wife very much and was not prepared for such betrayal like any normal person. However, unlike many, he had no time to worry about himself or heal his pain. 
There were already enough things to care about, so he buried his emotions, feelings, and grievances as deeply as possible. With a strong will, the man cut off the past and tried not to think about or reflect on it. The future was ahead, and to make it happen, he had to solve new problems every day, hour, and minute. Raising two girls on his own was not the easiest task. As it turned out, girls and boys were from different planets and different universes. He fought with all his might to lift them up, accept them, help them, and protect them. It didn't always work, but he tried it every day. This hypercare, compensating for the absence of a mother, led to both daughters growing up as blatant egotists, if not worse. Their father was only of interest to them as a resource, and the favorite phrase was give me this. However, in a family, there should be some balance between what people give and receive. Otilio, on the other hand, only gave. He gave them everything he had. And Alfreda and Rebecca only received things. But it was never enough. It was insufficient for them. From their teenage years on, it became extremely difficult for them. The authority of the father figures simply ceased to exist if it ever existed in their early childhood. Out of habit, the man dumped all the blame on himself and took full responsibility for what was happening. The girls were only happy, hurting more with their already burdened sense of guilt. In the heat of an argument, to end it and tip the balance in their favor and emerge as the winners of any dispute or scandal, one could always shout at the end. Mom left because of you and your behavior. She abandoned us because she couldn't live with you. It's your fault that we grew up without a mother. Our horrible childhood is your fault. And they didn't even believe it themselves, but it was such a convenient and always reliable manipulation tactic that they couldn't let go of it. It always knocked the man off his feet, forcing him to surrender instantly. He could no longer object or resist. So, was it his fault that Alfreda and Rebecca grew up this way? Yes, undoubtedly, it was. Perhaps, somewhere, he didn't draw the line and didn't assert his authoritative paternal word. But Otilio loved his girls so much and was afraid to hurt them even more. In general, everything unfolded as it did. Nothing could be changed anymore. What grew, grew, as they say. Both girls started arranging their personal lives at an early age. Hormones must have been raging, and by that time, their minds were barely functioning at all. Otilio had so many troubles with them. It's always like this with children at that age. They always make the same mistakes. They make foolish decisions, shouting that they are already adults. But when the inevitable moment of reckoning arrives, they, with tails between their legs, run to their parents and cry out. It's a mess. Help. Otilio couldn't just put them in their place. He didn't have the moral strength for it. So, all he did was deal with the endless problems created by his daughters. Given their quarrelsome nature, egocentrism, and other charming qualities of young ladies, they always had problems. In general, nothing taught the girls to give back. According to their father, they were only used to taking and demanding. Taking care of him never entered their life plan. It didn't occur to them that a time might come when they would need to repay debts. When Otilio might need their help, support, and sympathy. That's why, when their father was suddenly diagnosed with cancer, it was a massive blow for both girls. Not because they felt sorry for their father. Perhaps a little, but that wasn't the main issue in the situation. The main issue was that they needed to take responsibility and start independently solving the emerging problems. Neither Rebecca nor Alfredo were ready for such a twist of fate. The girls talked among themselves and decided on a course of action. Of course, no one intended to tell their father about their plans. The girls, now young women, didn't consider principles of humanism or pay attention to moral considerations in their decisions and actions. No, they convinced each other that their steps were right and proceeded recklessly, disregarding everything. At first, they sweet-talked and made loud promises. They said many beautiful words, but it was all just to show off and to keep Otilio from doubts during the most critical moment. His daughters insisted that he sign a deed of gift transferring all the property he owned to them. 
Naturally, all of this was covered with eloquent speeches about doing it only to keep track and to quickly get funds for treatment in case of problems. They pleaded with their father for a long time. And, in the end, the exhausted father signed everything. Everything they asked for. It was easier for him to do this than to once again explain why he didn't want to. As soon as they left the notary, the man already understood what awaited him in the future. Unfortunately, he wasn't wrong. The whole plan for his beloved daughters became clear and ceased to be a secret. The apartment, money accounts, even the old car and garage, everything was divided among the sisters. They believed that the state should have taken care of their father, treated him, and looked after him. It's just amazing how people with such a worldview and character can even find excuses that they themselves believe in. Dad paid taxes, and now what? Should we pay for everything out of our own pockets? Alfreda said. Of course, it's absurd. What nonsense is this? It was at that damn factory that he undermined his health, Rebecca reiterated. Instantly forgotten was how many years the man had provided for, cared for, and protected his daughters. None of that mattered. The main thing was to find someone to blame and point fingers at, no matter how absurd and illogical the arguments and reasoning were. Believing and attacking the accused was important, and, under no circumstances, they shouldn't have admitted guilt and should have denied everything. The girls unanimously decided that their father had ruined his health working for the state. He paid taxes, and now the state, and only the state, should have taken care of the man. Without any remorse, all of Otilio's property was almost instantly sold. The money was divided equally between Alfreda and Rebecca, and the sick and frail father was immediately sent to a city hospice to spend his last days. How much time he had and what his days would be like no longer concerned his daughters. They had achieved what they wanted and departed from this stage of his life with a clear conscience. Otilio was simply in shock, waves of horror washing over him. He keenly felt his complete helplessness and utter uselessness when his daughters brought him to the medical facility and left him there. By then, the sisters had stopped hiding their true nature and intentions, even a little bit. They didn't even say beautiful words or promise that they would visit and see their father. No, why bother? They've already got everything they needed. Did Otilio ever question whether he was to blame for what had happened? Oh yes, regularly. During countless sleepless nights, he tried to analyze his life and understand where he had gone wrong. What, specifically, had he done wrong? Or were the genes to blame, passed on by the heartless mother who abandoned them? The questions were philosophical, there was no right answer to them. Altogether, they gave a result that was staggering in its scale of meanness and betrayal. While the father was deeply impressed by who he had ultimately raised, the girls were not concerned with moral or ethical questions. They both saw nothing extraordinary or condemnable in their actions and decisions. They both excellently supported each other in their meanness and hypocrisy, throwing it back and forth. We still have to live, everything is still ahead. Why should we forget about our future and spend our golden years, which we can't get back, by the bed of an ill man? It seemed they fueled each other and didn't give themselves the opportunity to doubt anything. For a brief period, it was still a reason for conversation and discussion, but then it was simply forgotten, erased from memory. Well, there was a mother, now there wasn't. There was a father, and he's gone. There wasn't a single impulse from either the younger or the older sister to ask about their father's health. To find out how he was doing now, how his treatment was going, and what his mood and overall condition were. All of this was deeply indifferent to both sisters. They had their own lives, and they lived them as best they could. Sometimes it was a bit disappointing that there was no longer someone who would come to the rescue, constantly help, and pull them out of various problems, but that's how it was. The sisters didn't miss Otilio as a person, but rather his function as a safety net, an unwavering helper, and a savior. Three years had passed since the moment the man was diagnosed with his disease. An equal amount of time was spent in hospice, where his daughters left him, depriving him of the possibility to live in his own apartment and taking everything away from him. Throughout this period, not once did either of his daughters visit or even call him. 
They were too busy, such communication didn't interest them. He also saw no point in calling. Otilio understood and realized everything when the door of the facility where they had simply dropped him off closed behind his daughters. The man didn't wish to hear any silly excuses or, even more so, the truth. Why bother? After all, sometimes the absence of an answer is the clearest and most honest answer. He was abandoned and betrayed. That's it, period. There was nothing more to discuss or reflect on. The entire situation changed abruptly and completely radically shifted the perspective from which the daughters viewed Otilio. One morning during a workday, Rebecca got an unexpected call on the phone. She answered, Hello. Hello. Is this Rebecca Borrego? She heard an unfamiliar female voice. That's my maiden name. I'm Rebecca Crespo now. What happened? Rebecca nervously asked. My name is Marina, and I am a notary's assistant. Please tell me how to contact and find your father, Otilio Borrego. Well, the daughter hesitated. Why do you need my dad? I can't tell you. I'm bound by the secrecy of a will, unfortunately. Rebecca was taken aback and had no idea what to do or say. Who could be looking for her father? Who could have left him an inheritance? Maybe their mother? Well, then it would be more logical if they were looking for the daughters, not the ex-husband. The woman decided to answer very cautiously. My father is ill and has been in a closed medical facility for a long time. Before disturbing him, I would like to find out what's going on. What secrecy of a will are you bound by? That also falls under the concept of secrecy, Rebecca, the notary's assistant, interrupted her. Am I correct in understanding that you won't tell me Otilio's address? I need to think about it and consult with my sister. Understand, you've confused me. Okay, I'll call you back soon. With that, without waiting for their agreement, Rebecca hung up. She was in shock and completely bewildered. Guesses tormented and tore her apart. In the same moment, the decision was made that it was impossible to do without Alfreda. It was indeed necessary to call her and tell her about the conversation. Alfreda didn't pick up the phone for a long time. Eventually, Rebecca heard a sleepy and disapproving voice. Rebecca, have you completely lost your mind? It's 9 a.m., it's my day off. Exactly. I suppose I could have postponed a non-urgent matter. Wake up, please, and listen carefully. The younger sister expressed herself in an authoritative tone and began to recount in detail the dialogue she had just had. After finishing, she asked Alfreda again. What do you think? I don't know, she wasn't sleepy at all. The second sister was also full of confusion. Perhaps everything needs to be checked. Do you think you can find out something? How, Rebecca? From whom? If I knew, I wouldn't be asking you. But you need to have accurate and detailed information to act wisely and with open eyes. Don't you agree? So, we need to find out everything as soon as possible. True. Okay. I'll think about it, Alfreda fell silent for a moment, as if checking her feelings, and after a pause, she uncertainly asked, Do you think Mom passed away and left a will? That was the first thing I thought, but in general, it's logical that in that case, it would be us in the will, not her ex-husband, from whom she ran away, Rebecca reasoned wisely. But she thought so constructively only because she had considered all possible options. She had simply had more time to grasp the problem than her younger sister. It sounds logical, Alfreda reluctantly agreed. Okay, Rebecca, I'll try to dig up something as quickly as possible. Fortunately, it's a day off today. But don't expect quick results, I haven't figured out where to start yet. Listen, I've got an idea. I told this assistant that Dad was in a medical facility. I think if she's persistent and hardworking enough, she's probably calling all of them. What do you think? Right. It finally clicked for Alfreda. If that's the case, we can proceed this way. Wait a few days and then try to talk with some nurses from the department where dad is. Not bad. 
Do you know anyone? How could I? Have we ever been there? No, of course not. But, in fact, the question isn't complicated. We should find and interest someone, Alfredo reasoned. Okay, then you take care of it and let me know what you can find out, and then we'll figure it out. Agreed. With that, the conversation between the two was over. Each of them pondered deeply about what had happened after it. Although there was some plan to gather information, both of them still wanted to develop at least some of their own conjectures. Nothing sensible came to the mind of either the younger or the older sister. They didn't know any relatives, they only had their father. Well, and nominally, their mother. Neither Alfreda nor Rebecca truly believed that Melba could suddenly appear in their lives, even if she were dead. Many years ago, she had eliminated her entire former family from her life. It's been three days since that conversation, and both women were terribly nervous. Their past lives and their father had not occupied such a significant place in their lives for a long time. Rebecca nervously messaged her younger sister several times a day with questions, but only received excuses. By the evening of the third day, Alfreda called her sister. Did you find out? She got straight to the point, wasting no time. I did. How? And what's there? Tell me. Don't drag it out, Alfreda. Rebecca was impatient. I told you that you just need to financially stimulate and motivate people. That's it. The case is simple. It turns out the notary has already been to Dad's. The younger sister admired herself and continued to drag it out with pleasure. Rebecca only breathed heavily into the phone, eagerly waiting for information. In general, we would never have guessed it ourselves, of course. Dad had a brother, Salvador. I vaguely remember that he used to talk about him sometimes. Salvador immigrated to the United States in the 80s. He used to be poor for a long time. A typical tough life for an immigrant. But he got incredibly lucky. He married a rich old lady. She died and left everything to Salvador. Now both Salvador and all his inheritance are gone. That is, to our father. You're lying. Rebecca burst out, for whom this whole story seemed like a fairy tale. She was older and remembered this story better about her father's brother. But still, the whole story seemed too unrealistic. Well, of course not, Rebecca. Why would I lie to you? The younger sister replied in an offended tone. The medical nurse from Dad's ward told me all this. She says everyone in the hospital is buzzing about this news now. Imagine the buzz. Everyone is talking about it. This nurse, Lorenza, says she personally heard everything the notary said. And do we know what's in the inheritance? Rebecca asked the main question, the one that interested her the most. Ah, uh, that's the main surprise. Yes, there's a list of properties on several sheets. Apartments, houses, accounts, and cars. The old lady used to be the wife of some big shot. I feel sick. Is this really true? It's even hard to imagine. It was evident that the older sister was genuinely in a state of shock. You yourself talked to the notary's assistant and pointed out where to find daddy. Well, there you go. They found him, and they rushed to him right away. It turned out that it happened in the evening on the day they called you. So fast. I guess they're interested in finding the heir themselves. They get paid for such work. I'm in shock. You've completely stunned me. I still can't believe how lucky we are, Rebecca. Alfreda was overwhelmed with joy at her words. It's only lucky for Dad at the moment, the older sister said. Of course, I've been thinking about that too. I called you to briefly tell you everything I learned. I think now it's time to part ways and think carefully about this situation. How can we get involved, and how can we get a piece of the pie? What do you think? I'd really like that, of course. Well, let's maybe meet at 8 tomorrow in our cafe and brainstorm. Okay. Both women were in a state of euphoria, confusion, and perplexity simultaneously. Each of them experienced an indescribable range of feelings and emotions. Oh, 
If they only knew back then that on the horizon was not some shabby local apartment and a sluggish bank account. Of course, then they would have run for daddy with open arms and a smile. But what to do now? Self-reproach was absolutely pointless at this point. If ifs and buts were candy and nuts, the story doesn't tolerate the subjunctive mood. Now the questions were completely different. How to try to fix the situation? Is it even possible, in principle? Throughout the next day, Alfreda and Rebecca tried to come up with a strategy for how to proceed. And honestly, they didn't want to admit it, but there were also questions. Should they have acted at all? They desperately wanted to believe that their loving, forgiving father would understand and forgive everything. But what if not? What if, when they showed up, all they got was a scandal and reprimands? They didn't even want to admit to themselves that such a reaction would be fair and honest. Mutual, for sure. Acknowledging this was very bitter and frustrating. After all, they had been building a brick wall of justifications for their despicable actions for so long. All these thoughts were swirling in the heads of both women. They were even more confused when they met than the day before. With each passing minute, additional questions arose, and more and more concerns added tension to the atmosphere. What have you decided, sister? Instead of a greeting, Rebecca decided to ask the main question. On the rights of an older sister, she would never admit it, but deep down, she understood that the younger one was much more cunning and resourceful than herself. I think we have nothing to lose, Alfreda sighed. What do you mean? Well, let's go. Dad will tell us to go away, yell, and make a scene. And so what? Is it a trifle compared to what's at stake? It's reasonable, of course, but... Rebecca really wanted to know if Alfreda felt any shame herself, but she didn't want to start this conversation first. Fortunately, the younger one perfectly captured the mood. Do you want to ask how my conscience is doing? Alfreda smirked. It's fine, but no worse than yours. I see no point in worrying about what's already done and long gone. Honestly, mine is not doing well. You can consider me a rag, as usual, but I feel. I can't even find the right word for this emotion. Awkward? Probably. It's one thing to live and convince yourself that everything was done right. Another is to look our father in the eyes. We will have to talk to him to explain everything. And so? Alfreda completely didn't understand the sister's emotional torment. Alfreda, what should we tell him? We promised care and attention, and we sentenced him to spend the rest of his days in hospice and took everything away. I don't understand. Did you only find out about this today? You lived with it for three years, and it was okay. It didn't pinch or bother you. And now suddenly. Yes, Rebecca interrupted. It's one thing to make deals with oneself, and a completely different thing is to look at his eyes. We will have to talk to him and justify ourselves. I don't know. I think if he wanted to accuse us, he would have called back then when he realized we ditched him, the imperturbable younger sister replied. Listen, how can you say that? Do you have a conscience? Oh, here we go. Rebecca, did I come up with this all by myself? Maybe I did it alone? Maybe you didn't participate or didn't take your share of the money. Maybe you didn't visit Dad all these three years? I'm not absolving myself of this, and I'm ready to admit that my actions are unpleasant and characterize me poorly. But that's not the point. I'm talking about how to face the fact that he will judge our behavior. Well, as usual... We'll come, lower our gazes, and apologize. If he doesn't understand, if it doesn't work out, then we'll know we at least tried. And if it works out, at least you understand the prospects. Alfreda dreamily said, You seem very cynical about it. Your way doesn't seem to be working at all. I'm not insisting, of course, you're free to act as you see fit. I just think your evaluation is strange. As if you're afraid to face his reaction now. Weren't you afraid back then? I thought I'd never see him again, Rebecca admitted, hanging her head. Life circumstances always change. You need to take it more calmly, I think. Anyway, 
You can do as you please, but I, absolutely for sure, will try. No options. Don't even try to talk me out of it. Such a chance comes once in a lifetime. I'm not a fool. I'm not going to throw away a winning lottery ticket. I need to at least try to cash it in. Alfreda triumphantly looked at her older sister. With her words, she somehow managed to inspire Rebecca, who had doubts until the last moment. In general, she had always followed Alfreda's lead since childhood as the younger sister. She knew how to lead from an early age, manipulated people excellently, and always got her way. And now, effortlessly, she persuaded her sister to join her side. Sure, I'll go with you, Rebecca said humbly. Well, all right then. Lift your spirits, sister. You act like you're going to work hard. He won't hit us, for sure. Well, maybe scold a bit, so what? Alfreda expressed her usual attitude. Rebecca asked her younger sister to give her at least a few days. She didn't respond with understanding, but she didn't engage in a confrontation right away. They had enough time. And anyway, Alfreda didn't want to appear before their father immediately after the notary. This situation with the sudden enlightenment and revelation seemed too far-fetched. Moreover, if they came a day after the announcement of the inheritance, Alfreda calmly accepted the fact that anything could happen, any reaction from their father. Rebecca mentally prepared for the visit, trying to understand how to act and what to say. In the end, she just gave up. She realized that they would have to improvise and probably couldn't predict anything. It was impossible even to imagine how Otilio would behave. Only from him could they derive guidance for their reactions. There was no more postponing, and the sisters went to the reception hours at the medical institution where they had placed their father. They decided it was forever. As it turned out, we can only hope and assume that someone from above dictates our actions and knows for sure that we can do nothing. Of course, trying to imagine themselves at their best, Rebecca and her sister bought various goodies to pamper their father. They didn't want to show up empty-handed after three years of separation. No matter how much they prepared, no matter how many possible reaction scenarios of Otilio's behavior they played out in their heads, the sisters could never have predicted this option in real life. Their father simply pretended that nothing had happened. He greeted them as if they had said goodbye just yesterday, as if their visit was a matter of course. Alfreda and Rebecca entered the recreation room, where the nurse directed them, indicating Otilio's location. They recognized him immediately. He was sitting with some old man at a table, playing cards. The women approached carefully and, from behind his back, uttered, Hello, Dad. Otilio turned slightly, glanced at the visitors, and calmly said, Hi. Wait, I need to finish the game. They were flabbergasted. They expected anything and everything, but not this. Naturally, there was nothing left to do but sit down meekly on the hard couch by the window and wait for their father to finish. It probably took about 15 minutes. The sisters were so shocked that they didn't even talk to each other, nor did they exchange glances. They were just sitting silently, staring at the players, and waiting for their turn. Why did you come? Otilio immediately started with the most important question as soon as he approached his daughters. We, Rebecca stammered, she didn't have time to prepare for the onslaught. All her enthusiasm, for which she had mentally prepared herself in advance, dissipated during the waiting time. We wanted to know how you're doing, Alfreda, unlike her sister, managed to quickly compose herself and respond directly, looking her father in the eyes. Why all of a sudden? He smirked in response. Dad, why do you start like that? Alfreda decided that the best defense was an attack and immediately changed her previous tactic. Do you think it was easy to make up our minds and come? It wasn't that simple. Maybe then you shouldn't have disappeared? Otilio asked in the same manner. Okay, let's not argue right away. The conversation didn't begin immediately, but somehow it began to restore itself and shifted into a somewhat more peaceful channel. Otilio spoke coldly and perhaps even indifferently. But, in any case, it was much better than the sisters expected. 
Trying to persuade their father to tell them the news about the inheritance, the cunning younger daughter began to share details of her life. She did it moderately, without speaking too much about herself, so that the interlocutor would want to engage in a conversation. Nothing worked. The father responded calmly and evenly. He only spoke about himself in terms that were already obvious, something about treatment, something about life in the hospice. However, no matter how the sisters tried to cleverly get some information, they didn't succeed. Of course, no one planned to talk about the death of their father's brother directly. Neither Alfreda nor Rebecca planned to discuss with their father what they knew about the sudden wealth that had befallen him. On the contrary, their plan was to try to convince their father of their selflessness and that the inheritance event and their appearance were not related. Of course, they were not fools, and they guessed that their father was not a fool. Of course, he would think these two events were connected. But knowing for sure and guessing are two big differences. Moreover, the sisters had agreed in advance that if Otilio decided to share with his daughters, they would feign surprise. But the women received no information about what had happened. After some time, Alfreda decided that they needed to approach the issue with military cunning. She began to ask leading questions that hinted at the topic they needed. Not directly, of course, but nevertheless. She asked about family members who communicate with Otilio. Maybe someone visited him? At least call him? They only received a negative answer to this. Rebecca was chatting about unexpected meetings and news that happened in life and often occurred when you least expected them. The father was just listening silently to everything the older daughter said and remained silent, occasionally nodding. Everything that the women led to in their conversations or just idle talk always ended the same way. Otilio pretended to be oblivious. When he went to the bathroom, Alfreda hissed at her older sister. That's it, we should stop. Our subtle hints are becoming evident with each passing minute. Perhaps he needs time. He can't just open up to us again, apparently, it hasn't healed yet. Yes, you're probably right, Rebecca sighed. After the unexpected reaction during the meeting with their father, she somehow ignited with enthusiasm that everything would be much easier. Everything would go smoothly as before. When Otilio returned, the conversation flowed less tensely. But the sisters, as agreed, no longer hinted at anything and led a normal, ordinary conversation. In the recreation room, where they had been sitting all this time, there was a television that never stopped working. They were sitting in a corner, not interfering with those who wanted to watch, and the TV sound didn't disrupt their conversation. At some point, Alfreda's eyes slid over the working screen, and she saw that they were showing the movie brother. The decision was made in a second. Oh, look, that's the film brother. She drew the attention of her father and older sister. By the way, Dad, how's your brother, Uncle Salvador? Alfreda immediately received an unnoticed but very painful hit on her leg from her older sister. I don't even know. We haven't talked for a long time, Otilio lied without blinking an eye. Did Alfreda regret not restraining her sudden impulse? Yes and no. Although... In principle, she was accustomed to never blaming herself for anything in her life. She saw no practical sense in it. One thing became clear. Her father was not ready to surrender his position and defended his secret. The cunning of the daughters clearly did not pass. He even dared to resort to outright lies just to close off. Alfreda knew her father well enough to understand that this decision was not taken lightly. Unlike herself, he couldn't stand lies and preferred to remain silent or not disclose information if necessary. Outright lies were extremely uncharacteristic for him. Some time passed after what Alfreda did. The women were sitting, chatting about different things with their father, and then left. They promised to visit again soon. Again in three years? Otilio couldn't resist a sarcastic remark. Of course, the sisters tried awkwardly to turn this question into a joke. As soon as the women left and the entrance doors closed behind them, Rebecca instantly pounced on her younger sister. Is this what you call wrapping it up? Why did you even do that? She almost shouted. Opportunity presented itself. But you noticed that dad lied, even though he hates lying. 
so all our tricks and half hints were like water off a duck's back. He intends to keep this information to himself until the end. When he didn't tell us to go away immediately, I thought it would be easier, honestly, Rebecca gloomily admitted. Between us, over the years, a wall of mistrust has grown, and our task is to break it down so that he starts trusting us, Alfreda patiently explained. Do you know how to do that? No, we need to think about it. Analyze what happened today, draw conclusions, and avoid mistakes. Rebecca looked approvingly at her younger sister, but decided not to say anything. What was the point? She knew very well that Alfredo was much better at dealing with these matters. Alfreda had been a master of manipulation and a great strategist since childhood. So, whether the operation would be a success or a failure depended solely on her. Rebecca could only play the role of a calm executor of someone else's will in this case. So, until tomorrow? The older sister asked. Yes, I'll think and come up with some options. Now I need to go home, take a rest, and lie down in a hot bath. I'm tired, honestly, and exhausted. That was decided. The sisters said their goodbyes and agreed to meet again the next day to think with fresh minds. The next day, Rebecca eagerly awaited Alfreda's call early in the morning. Unexpectedly, even for herself, she had some thoughts. When they finally met, the older sister immediately began to explain. Alfreda, I couldn't sleep all night, trying to put myself in Dad's shoes. You understand psychology perfectly and know how to make people do what you need, but I... Don't make a monster out of me, okay? The sister interrupted. Hold on. Listen to me. I tried to put myself in Dad's place. What would I do in his situation? Especially since we already know something. We have something to start with after yesterday's meeting and talks. In general, I think we need to get rid of his disbelief and mistrust by any means. Why don't we just ask him outright what he wants? Admit our fault, say that we were young, foolish, and didn't know what we were doing. And he'll fall for it. Are you serious? Listen, Dad doesn't know that we know about Salvador's death and that Dad is his only heir, Rebecca argued. He's not stupid, Rebecca. He can add two plus two. What do you think? Even a five-year-old would have figured it out by now. Alfreda completely rejected the proposed behavior concept. You just don't want to listen to me. Yes, he's not a fool. Yes, he can guess why we came up with this. Who's arguing? But I suggest admitting our fault and actively repenting. Do you get it? Actively. Are you suggesting we directly ask him what he wants and under what conditions he'll believe us? Believe that we've changed our minds and realized our wrongdoing? Alfreda asked, raising her right eyebrow as a sign of increasing distrust. That's exactly what I'm saying. Seems like nonsense to me, the younger sister muttered. Well, what do you suggest? Rebecca asked, although such behavior in her relationship with her younger sister was completely uncharacteristic. I don't know. I haven't decided yet, Alfreda stammered. Listen, you can't decide or come up with a plan. Then just listen to me. I rarely ask for this. It's an emotional problem, do you understand? What is our main goal? The inheritance. How do we achieve it? To make Dad believe in us again despite what we did in the past, Rebecca hesitated slightly, but then gathered herself under the heavy gaze of her sister and continued. So, I am absolutely, 100% convinced that the only way to achieve this is through honesty. Clear, cautious honesty. We shouldn't say that we appeared in his life just because we found out about a very serious inheritance, the woman chuckled. Nevertheless, honesty is the foundation. Then he will give us his conditions. And here we have to go all out, whatever it takes. Break ourselves into pieces, but do everything he asks. Brave, very brave, Rebecca. And it's clear what he'll ask for. What would you ask for if you were in his place? Clearly, he wants to return home and get his apartment back. Well, that's a test of strength. Rebecca exclaimed so loudly that other restaurant visitors began turning to their table. 
Quiet, what are you doing? Well, okay, let's assume it's a test. But we'll really have to do it if we follow your logic and your plan. And how did you want it, Alfreda? To come, apologize, find out about the inheritance, and immediately hope that Daddy will hand it over to us right away? Right there in the chief physician's office, with a notary, while he will stay there to live out his days. Rebecca attacked. She herself found it strange to behave like this, but right now she couldn't understand her younger sister at all. No, of course not, Alfreda hesitated. Not like that. Are you suggesting we buy him an apartment? Probably, yes. So what? There's a lot more money at stake, haven't you forgotten? No, but isn't it too much? Alfreda, I really don't understand you right now. I don't understand how you plan to get Dad to transfer Salvador's property to us. Well, we've already deceived him once. We need to regain his trust. At any cost. Whatever he asks for, the gain will outweigh all our efforts. Consider it just an investment. It's a very expensive and unreliable investment. Alfreda didn't give in. You don't have any plan at all, Rebecca retorted. And that doesn't mean you can act poorly because of it. The younger sister didn't back down. Okay, this is just bickering. Alfreda, let's be constructive. We don't have much more time. I've thought about it and presented my arguments in detail. I understand, okay. Let it be your way. Apparently, there really aren't any other options to regain Dad's trust. Alfreda gave in. Rebecca tried her best to maintain a neutral expression, but inside, she was beaming with joy and triumph. Despite being the older sister, she had always been the follower, always submissive, going along with things. She rarely won in any argument or dispute with her younger sister. So the fact that she was able to outplay Alfreda in such a complex and serious matter now, oh, the taste of victory was so sweet especially considering the importance and principled nature of the decision they had just made. Without jokes and unnecessary pathos, their entire future might depend on the choices made here and now. Yes, even without excessive caution, it definitely did depend. It was an unequivocal victory. For some time, the sisters discussed details and rough edges, but in essence, Rebecca's idea was accepted as the main plan. The sisters agreed to meet and go to their father in three days, already repentant and offering peace. They wanted to mend their father-daughter relationship, forget the past, and leave it behind. They didn't even have to apologize to smoothly approach the issue. On the second meeting, Otilio behaved somewhat more gently with his daughters, but it was clear that he was still hurt. It would be strange to blame or reproach him for it, of course. Nevertheless, some distance, unsaid things, and neutrality remained between them during the dialogue. Rebecca decided to ask the question that hung in the air during the last meeting but was left unspoken by the daughters. They did ask how their father was feeling, but they didn't ask about his oncological illness. Perhaps they were afraid or felt awkward. It was probably a symbiosis of conflicting feelings. Dad, how's your illness? It's in a stable remission so far. I hope it'll be this way. Thank God. Thanks to the doctors, literally, they saved me. Well done. Otilio answered without any hesitation. Dad, Alfreda began. I understand that we are very guilty before you, and I understand that forgiving us is not easy and probably unlikely. But please understand us, we were just scared. In childhood, mom abandoned us, we were terribly tired of losses, and we were just afraid of losing you too. It was so painful and terrible. It was stupid, unforgivable behavior, a mistake. Rebecca looked at her sister and couldn't believe her eyes. Alfredo was crying. The theatrical institute director himself would confidently say about this scene, I believe it. How can we atone for our guilt? How can we become close again? Saying this obviously pre-prepared text for Rebecca, Alfreda, following the dramatic structure, went from unimpressive stuttering to hesitating at each word. Then, a single tear rolled down her cheek. And on the last crucial question, she slightly broke down in tears. 
Rebecca was shocked by her sister's artistic abilities and couldn't shake off the thought. Surely, she used these tricks against me, too, more than once, these acting antics. But she quickly dismissed it. After all, now was not the time or place for reflection. It was necessary to maintain the face and mood of the team Rebecca was playing for. She couldn't cry like a sister. She didn't have those abilities. But she quickly portrayed a suffering, mournful, and sad face. As well as repentance, which was supposed to be read from the woman's stooped and slightly lowered head. Otilio seemed as if he had been waiting for this main question. He hesitated a bit for the sake of decency and to maintain a pause, but the answer was clearly prepared. Well, what can I say to you, girls? To restore our relationship and regain my status quo, I want to come back home. As you understand, living here is not happy at all, it is just bearable. But, of course, I completely understand, Rebecca eagerly confirmed, interrupting her father. After that, the topic was not further discussed, it somehow faded away on its own, and the dialogue shifted to another subject. Although each participant in the meeting, of course, could only think about what had been said. And they pondered what would come next and where it would lead. Otilio, naturally, was waiting to continue this topic while the girls wanted to consult with each other again. Their father didn't notice, but they exchanged glances. Over the years, they were certainly able to understand each other without unnecessary words. And without verbal communication, each understood what was on the other's mind at a given moment. After they left, the sisters automatically turned and headed to the park. They walked in silence, each immersed in her own thoughts. Both Rebecca and Alfredo were trying to figure out how to take advantage of what was happening. What do you think? Rebecca was the first to speak as soon as the sisters sat on a bench away from prying eyes. Well, what? If we've decided to accept your plan, then we need to act. We need to go back to Dad in a few days and tell him that we agree to his terms and that they are fair. I thought for a long time after our last conversation in the restaurant and came to the conclusion that you were right after all. Probably, there's no other way for us in the shortest possible time. If we want to get the Salvador inheritance into our hands, we inevitably need to gain complete trust from Dad and rehabilitate ourselves as much as possible in his eyes. I'm glad we've reached a consensus. Maybe we should split the cost of the apartment for him. What do you think? I think so. Sharing risks and rewards, right? Do you think we can pull it off? Rebecca asked her younger sister a bit ingratiatingly. Right now, she really missed a shoulder she could always rely on. If we play it all out wisely. Oh yes, about playing it out. You just killed me today, Rebecca interrupted Alfreda and rambled on. How could you play it like that? When you started crying, I almost burst into tears myself. Well, what did you expect? We need to put all our effort into this now. We have no room for error. Rebecca, I want you to listen to me carefully. It's really important now. We are in the same boat, and if we suffer a shipwreck, it will affect both of us. And if we emerge, it will be a shared victory and success. We must fully dedicate ourselves to solving the current problems right now. If we've decided to get into this, that's it, we're going all the way. It doesn't sound very promising, to be honest, Rebecca admitted her fears. Well, my dear, you came up with it yourself and agreed to Dad's conditions, actively repenting, as you put it. Why retreating now? No retreating, Alfreda. It's just the way you talk about it, as if our whole lives depend on it, she faltered, realizing that in essence, that was true. Indeed. You even stumbled there. We're risking money for the apartment. Well, if worse comes to worse, we'll sell it. And we risk that if we make a mistake, Dad will run away to the islands with all the money, and we'll be left here. We'll be watching him lie on the beach, enjoying the sun, and sipping cocktails. Alfreda, you seem to have taken my ideas too much to heart. Can you ease up a bit? Rebecca was bothered by how deeply her younger sister embraced her arguments. Even the joy of winning the argument was no longer enjoyable. A tough conversation had taken place between the sisters. 
there were arguments and disputes. A consensus was reached only after several hours. They decided that it was foolish to turn around and flee the battlefield now. They were already mentally exhausted by this situation. It would be strange to leave this idea behind. They decided that, for better or worse, they would do what Otilio said. Yes, and if he says jump, the only question is how high, Alfreda joked sadly. It's the price to pay. Well, who knew it would turn out like this? If three years ago we had known that Salvador would settle so successfully and that something might go wrong for us, then we couldn't have even thought about such a thing. You can't predict everything. Of course, you try to calculate the options, but quite often something escapes your attention and then it comes back to haunt you. Or it's just some triviality or events that were unknown at the decision-making point. Like in our case. Well, yes. It never happened before, and now it happened again, I remembered the famous quote. And it's always so appropriate. Never loses its relevance. Okay, enough of the poetry, Rebecca. I'm so tired, you can't even imagine. As if I were unloading freight cars. Same. So deal. Till the end? Till the end. No options, sis. They clapped their hands and went their separate ways. Having made the final decision, they wanted to take a break from each other, even though both women were exhausted. The thing is, Alfredo was born without a conscience, and Rebecca quickly learned the same. So, for them, apologizing and coming up with schemes to be forgiven were completely new experiences. In an ordinary situation, they would twist and turn until the last minute to avoid being in the guilty party's position. When they made the decision about Otilio three years ago, they couldn't even imagine that such a reckoning would come later. If the prize hadn't been so significant, they wouldn't have budged from their positions. They wouldn't have subjected themselves to such self-mockery or gone against their nature for any other reason. Greed motivated them greatly and compelled them to make concessions that couldn't be motivated by anything else. Finally, it was time for their next visit to their father. They needed to honestly and openly declare that they were ready to accept his conditions. They were ready to bring him home and buy him an apartment. When they arrived, Otilio was once again playing cards and asked his daughters to wait. He employed the same tactic as in the first meeting, trying to confuse them and deprive them of prepared responses and behaviors. The man understood from the first time that circumstances had favored him and the trick needed to be repeated. The sisters had to wait patiently again, observing their father's deliberate leisureliness. When he approached his daughters, the conversation initially revolved around trivial matters. They talked about almost anything but the essential issues, as if they were strangers. Rebecca's nerves gave way first, and she got to the point, starting with the main issue. Dad, Alfreda, and I have thought about the words you said during the previous meeting. What are you talking about right now? The man intentionally interrupted his older daughter, attempting to throw her off and demonstrate his complete detachment and lack of interest. I mean that for you to believe in us, we need to repent, not just in words, of course, but demonstrate that we have changed. For your sake, we are willing to change. Rebecca's communication style slightly threw off her father. She stumbled a bit, but overall, she held herself well. It looked quite convincing from the outside. So, it's clear that you want to come back, leave here, and live alone again. It's fair that you're asking us to buy you an apartment. Of course, we are obligated to give you back what we took. Finally expressing the main point, Rebecca lowered her head, portraying complete submission and readiness to accept any fate. Otilio remained silent, merely shifting his gaze between one daughter and the other. Yes, Dad, Alfreda decided to intervene and support her sister. We've decided that this is the only possible way to restore our relationship. To bring them back to the point where we once stopped. We truly regret that we hesitated back then and acted unfairly. Can you let us make things right? We're family. We should be together. We love you very much. Really, Alfreda concluded her speech with tears welling up again. To Rebecca, it seemed a bit forced, like an excessive grotesque, but it would suffice. 
The daughters looked at their father, lowering their gaze and awaiting his response. He showed no emotions, his face revealing nothing, and, apparently, he had no intention of speaking. He was thinking it over. The sisters were staring at him, frozen, anticipating his reply. Fine, Otilio finally uttered. It was evident how the daughters breathed a sigh of relief at his initial response. But how do you envision this? He asked. The sisters hesitantly exchanged glances, as if not fully understanding the essence of the question. Alfreda took the initiative. What do you mean by how? We'll buy an apartment and take you away from here. Whose apartment will it be? The father asked sternly. Well, Rebecca hesitated. Is that important? Alfreda asked, almost defiantly, but quickly realizing her position, she added, I really don't understand. No, my girls, it won't work like that. Let's rewind a bit. Three years ago, I signed a deed of gift for all my property to both of you and ended up here, the man gestured with his hands, as if illustrating his speech. So, I'll only return to my apartment without any encumbrances. I'm not a boy running back and forth. But, Alfreda tried to find arguments in her favor, but nothing came to mind. Besides, I'm not a fool. Understand, I'm here on the basis of my previous diagnosis. I wasn't admitted here for my good looks. Currently, I don't have any diagnosis nominally, and if I leave, no one will bring me back here, Otilio asserted reasonably. Okay, Alfreda sighed. If it makes you feel more at ease. Otherwise, I won't go anywhere. I don't want to move back to the streets in a month if you change your mind. It's one thing to live in a shelter and another to be on the streets. The man was incredibly persuasive in presenting his arguments. What are you saying? How can you? Rebecca started to speak up for sense, but when she wanted to continue her prepared phrase, she realized how silly it would look if she said it. After all, they had already evicted their father upon closer inspection. So, we'll buy the apartment, and it will be your property, Alfreda interjected to salvage her older sister a bit. Rebecca looked at her in gratitude. If we're going that way, girls, I also want the money. The ones from my personal savings. What's left after selling the garage and my car, Otilio continued without stopping. He wanted to restore the initial financial status on all fronts. Okay, of course. We'll open an account in your name and deposit the money there, Rebecca declared, not waiting for the reaction of her younger sister, even disregarding it. Because, firstly, she understood that there were no options, it was a fair demand from her father. Secondly, she still felt awful after the thoughtless remark and was trying to redeem herself in her father's eyes. Of course, it'll be yours, Alfreda repeated like a sleepwalker. She, too, understood the futility of arguments. Both women realized that this was their only chance. If they protested against any of Otilio's demands now, it would be the complete and irrevocable end of their relationship. There would be no way to help them afterwards. They had trapped themselves, and now they were enjoying the fruits of their vigorous activities. The only comfort was that each sister whispered to herself like a mantra that this was not an expense in vain, but an extremely successful and profitable investment, a ticket to their bright future. Inwardly, they hoped that he would not ask for anything beyond this. After all, their resources were also limited. Fortunately, in this conversation, Otilio did not continue this topic. They agreed on the main points, and it was good. The women were already exhausted, it was quite enough for them. But then the sisters' lives turned into a real nightmare for a while. The ordeal began when the father was very picky about choosing an apartment. He didn't like one, then the other. Either he wasn't satisfied with the neighborhood, the building, or the floor. Dad, what do you want? Rebecca couldn't help asking after Otilio once again rejected a bunch of listings even before viewing them. My old apartment. The man answered angrily, glaring at his daughter. That argument was strong, of course, there was no way around it. What could you say to that? How could you respond? Right, right, he was right on all accounts. 
and they were wrong, so they had to stand obediently and execute the commands given by the head of the show. When they found a suitable apartment and the father was satisfied with the personal inspection of the living space, a new ordeal began. Now, he insisted on good renovations. I want my apartment to be like the one normal people have, like I had before. With this, he tormented his daughters, endlessly scolding, being dissatisfied, and criticizing. Otilio acted like a spoiled child, extracting more and more from his daughters. His appetites only grew. There was always something wrong, whether this or that. The renovation cost was something the daughters didn't even want to remember because their eyes would instantly twitch. It took an enormous amount of effort, time, nerves, and, of course, money. Then came the negotiation about the amount the daughters had to repay their father. A million. One million, Otilio insisted. Are you out of your mind? Seriously? For the shabby, rundown garage and the car that was falling apart? Alfreda defended her interests in some way. Well, you shouldn't have sold my car and my garage. Now we wouldn't be arguing about their value. And that was how he responded to everything. Indeed, an ironclad argument. What could he say to that? Nothing. To agree, again and again, to go along with it. One day... After another meeting with their father, the sisters went to Rebecca's place to have a drink. They didn't want to see anyone. They needed support. But who could give it to them now, if not each other? What a cunning old fox he is. Alfreda began her rant, not even taking a sip, just pouring the first portion of alcohol. First, he demands the apartment, and then he insists on it being in his name. And now, renovations? Unbelievable. Neither you nor I have anything like that. He's quite the shrewd one, isn't he? Her older sister, who was also in a foul mood, said. Money in his account. Is that okay? He's asking for a million. Well, that's beyond the realm of good and evil. Don't you think? The price of his garage and that rickety bucket with nuts was, by those times, maybe 250 at most. If not less. Don't remind me, please. It makes me want to cry. I've already begged for so much money on the sly. Alfredo was terribly indignant. Talking with their father became increasingly difficult, and hiding their true feelings and emotions was incredibly challenging. Oh, don't even mention it. I've spent almost all my savings, Rebecca shared. I've already borrowed money. I have nothing left. When I get furious, the older sister shared, I think it's payback for our thoughtless actions. We need to work it off. Then there will be the lesson, and the universe will reward us again. It's tempting, of course. I also think about everything that Nurse Lorenza talked us into at that time and then calmed down. But when I talk to Dad, it seems like I'm about to explode, and sparks will fly from my eyes. I feel absolutely the same. But telling him no right now. Have you lost your mind? Alfreda interrupted the older sister. So much has been done. So much has been spent. All for nothing? No, we need to strain all our efforts and continue silently enduring all these eternal nitpickings and endless desires of dad, which are as costly as an airplane wing. You also think he's testing us like this, don't you? Why else would he torment us like that? How many such apartments will he have tomorrow? I think, of course, it's all to test us. So giving up so close to victory is simply unthinkable. I think the same and hope for the best. When he finally pushes us too far or calculates his investments, I meditate and imagine myself on a yacht. Rebecca laughed. Yeah, me too. I repeat it like autogenic training. It's an investment, Alfreda. Endure this nightmare silently, and it will all pay off. He torments us without being deceitful. Oh, don't even mention it, sister. I hope, to be frank, that any day now he'll move for good and unveil the secret about the inheritance in his new place. What do you think? The younger one indulged in dreams. I also want to believe in that. After all, in my opinion, we passed the test with a 6 out of 5. Not, it's a 10. 
What are you talking about? We returned everything we took and even more. Not without a nervous tick, but we did return it, didn't we? Alfreda flared up. Rebecca contagiously laughed in response to her younger sister's sharp reaction. They endured everything quietly and peacefully, hoping that any moment now, Otilio would finally relent and thaw. A few days passed, and Alfreda called her older sister. Rebecca, did you also get a message from Dad? Yeah, tomorrow. We just can't believe, honestly, that we survived this real hell. Me too. I'm keeping my fingers crossed and making a wish that tomorrow he'll finally tell us about the wealth that has fallen on us, Alfreda laughed. She had talked about it with her sister several times a week, and she herself had speculated countless times about such a possibility. I'm waiting for the same. I hope the Lord hears our lamentations. By the way, since it's a housewarming, we should give something, right? Rebecca asked. We've already given him so much, the younger sister almost shouted. Stop it. Come on, we've almost done it. I thought it would be foolish to give up now and show who we really are, Rebecca answered conciliatorily and judiciously. You're right, of course, I'm sorry. I'm already so nervous and under chronic stress. Sorry for losing my temper. I don't know, what do they usually give? Probably something for the house. Okay, buy some inexpensive indoor plants. Just inexpensive, enough of spending on this old miser. And I'll buy a cake, is that okay? It should be fine, I suppose. And yes, Alfreda, what you said about the old miser was spot on. Keep yourself in check, please. I'm telling you, I'm not saying it to outsiders. And not to our insatiable dad himself. I'm just terribly fed up. I'm in debt myself, thanks to his stupid test. Come on, pull yourself together. Just a little left, Rebecca encouraged her younger sister and disconnected. In front of her, she still maintained composure and the appearance of self-control, although inside her, emotions were swirling no less. Alfreda was right, their father's checks had become unbearable. They had redeemed their guilt, and it was clear that the punishment was now excessive. Well, tomorrow it all will become clear, Rebecca concluded, summing up her emotional outburst. Indeed, she and her sister were already rubbing their eager hands together. They were confident that everything was going in their favor. They believed in it, convincing themselves that Otilio, at his new place during the celebration, would not be able to contain himself and would surely reveal everything to his daughters about the check, the death of his brother Salvador, and, of course, his inheritance. Although it would have been better to start with that, undoubtedly. The women had uplifted mood in the early morning. They anticipated the end of their torment, the finale, and the resolution. They felt like singing and dancing with joy. What held them back was the fact that their father hadn't revealed his cards yet. As agreed, the sisters brought a gift for their father and a treat. Otilio himself was in good spirits, and his daughters perceived this as a good sign and a positive omen. First, of course, there was a tour of the apartment. Although it was somewhat strange, as the daughters themselves had done the renovation. But they couldn't refuse their father, especially in such a trifle. It clearly brought him true pleasure. At the table, the conversation was initially very casual. They spoke as if about trivial matters related to the apartment and the renovation. About what else needed to be done. Somehow, unexpectedly, Otilio started talking about his relatives. At first, he mumbled something about his parents, but his daughters barely listened. They were waiting for the denouement and the coveted name. Their hearts sank. Both sisters restrained their overflowing joy and the triumphant cry of finally. Meanwhile, their father continued to mutter something, telling a story. When Alfreda finally heard the phrase, my brother Salvador, she physically twitched. The woman looked around slyly, hoping that her father didn't notice such a reaction. Otilio droned on for about ten minutes, providing a detailed and tedious account of his brother. The daughters were physically exhausted by waiting, and everything inside them was boiling. 
The ladies listened very attentively, afraid to miss any important information amidst all this verbal diarrhea, which was unnecessary for anyone but carried vital information for them. The daughters even straightened up, sat neatly, and listened to every word in silence and wild tension. The end of the life story was all the more unexpected. Yes, my brother was there, but now he's dead. He was such a scoundrel. He was just as much of a human scum as you, girls. He kicked the bucket alone, almost in the dumpster. Due to the shock, the sisters felt like they were suffocating. Of course, Alfreda couldn't resist, and, looking at her father's satisfied smirk, she asked again. What did you just say? That my brother Salvador kicked the bucket alone and in poverty. It was a fitting fate for such a bastard. And what? Did you expect to hear something else? Otilio said this and burst into a hearty laugh, pleased with his successful joke. I don't understand, Rebecca said, now finally starting to come to her senses. Not only are you vile creatures, but you're also complete idiots. I didn't believe until the last moment that you'd fall for it. Lorenza played her part well, didn't she? We've been rehearsing for a long time. You're joking, aren't you? The older daughter said, still not believing what was happening. Why would I? I'm very serious now, my dear girls. I think it went well. How did you like the performance? Was it convincing? The sisters exchanged glances and didn't know what to do or say. They were in complete shock. The joyous emotions that filled them just five minutes ago sharply gave way to disappointment, aggression, disbelief, and the realization of their own impenetrable stupidity. Otilio looked at his daughters, and a satisfied smile spread across his face from ear to ear. It was evident that the expression on their faces warmed his soul, acting as a healing bomb. We wrote the script for the entire department and rehearsed. The assistant to the notary, Marina, in reality was Claudia Santis. She won a competition for the role. She was chosen for her persuasiveness and the youthfulness of her voice. And Lorenza did a great job, our little nurse. Everyone did well, right? Everything was calculated. But I didn't think, girls, that you were such fools. It pleased and disappointed me at the same time. Why did you believe it? Although, of course, I knew that the unexpectedness would have an effect and that I hadn't shown up in three years, do you think it's a coincidence? No, girls. I'm grateful for my health. It didn't fail me. It allowed me to recover and serve you the sweetest of all dishes. So, how do you like it? You. Alfreda suddenly screamed. I wouldn't advise you to do that. The father interrupted sharply. I already have a will. Of course, you're not mentioned in it. Otilio laughed. Okay, get out immediately. And I never want to see you here again. If you dare to do anything, you probably understand that I no longer have paternal feelings for you. I will not spare anyone. Rebecca didn't say anything. She was in shock, moving like a sleepwalker. She saw no point in objecting or saying anything to her father. It only humiliated her. She just stood up from the table and headed towards the exit. Wait! Alfreda shouted to her. Apparently, she wanted to stop her sister and still try to assert their rights. Although she understood it herself, what can you do here? They really fell into their father's trap. Let's go, we have nothing else to do here, Rebecca replied quietly and very calmly. For the first time in her life, the younger sister, without resisting or showing any character, followed along, realizing that Rebecca was right. They really had nothing else to do here. It's all over, as they say. It was a loss. Closing the front door behind his daughters, Otilio looked around his apartment once again and smiled. Everything bad had already happened, and Evryon had learned the life lesson perfectly. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.